Um, I'm afraid we're very close to the end. Uh, can I um, still uh, have time for one or two questions from the, from the audience? <coughs> yes, please. My name is Volker Pertis. I'm the Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sudan. And just to, to add a little bit of evidence, in Sudan, we could show that COVAX works. We got 800,000 doses of vaccines through the COVAX initiatives, plus probably 200,000 doses from member countries. So it works, but it also show how, shows how, how insufficient that is. 800,000 plus 200,000 doses for a country of 30, 43 million means that at best we could vaccinate 1.5% of the population. Yeah. Now, if we are coming into a situation where less than 2% of the people are vaccinated in Africa and other developing regions, and 60, 70, 80% of people are vaccinated in the industrialized world, we are having a, another issue of decoupling, different from the one we discussed this morning when we spoke about the West and China, and we have another division of the world which is not healthy to anybody. And I would like to bring the discussion back to global governance and, and both the chair and, and Mr. Kramars uh, and uh, our Japanese speaker went very much into some of the, the necessities here. And I have heard comparisons this morning where some of you compared the situation with the fight against global terrorism, with the preparation for war. Um, and all these analogies are sort of useful to, for our thinking, but I would like also, because there are many economists here in the room, to draw a comparison to how we dealt with the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, which I think we did much more efficiently. Now, global governance, we all know, works best when heavy national interests of the heavyweights in the world are involved, and in the financial crisis, this was definitely the case. And it seems to me, I'm happy to be corrected, or in this case, I would be unhappy to be corrected, that with regard to financial risks, global cooperation, multilateral cooperation through things like the Financial Action Task Force is still functioning despite the rivalry between US and China, uh, which we are now seeing. So my question is to both you on the panel and then people in, in the audience who would might like to comment, can we, can we take a clue from how we dealt with the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, setting up international coordination mechanisms that have actually have been working and have been functioning since, and that since and have been maintained until today, despite your political rivalries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. And first, thank you for your comment on COVAX, that there are areas where people actually see the benefits of COVAX, but you've also pointed out first that the amount, the number of vaccines that came in is far below what is needed. And second, of course, we can't sustainably, as Juliette uh, Twakli already say, her, said in her intervention, rely on a system where um, the, the, the drugs, the vaccine, are made in the north, sold to rich countries, and then somehow redistributed. This is, this is untenable as, as a system. We have to, to change it. But with regard to your uh, second question, um, I, I wonder, Jean-Claude uh, Jean Trichet, whether I can call on you, because the question is um, um, the analogy between the current situation and the way the 2008-2011 crisis has been held. And one of the points that your commission, the high-level financing group in the G20, was uh, making is that the s f uh, stabilization fund that was created to deal with, with, with that crisis would be a good model to deal with the financing of preparedness and response. So would you wish to, to comment on this? Can we have a microphone here? Uh, and then we'll end the session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for, uh, for this question. I have to say that I was very impressed by the multidimensional vision we have after having heard uh, all members of the panel 
and your own remarks, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, yes, indeed, it seems to me that uh, when we discussed that, we had this analogy with the terrible crisis of the subprime and Lehman Brothers and uh, all the consequences it had on global financial and economic stability. And we thought that it was good to have this you know, new concept uh, that uh, we proposed, and I understand that it, it has some kind of emerging consensus. And we thought also that it was good to have a governance which would be uh, in a way which uh, has still to be optimized, but backed by the international community in asking the G20 to play some kind of important role. I, I know to which extent this is delicate, uh, but, but our own experience was that uh, uh, having a highly professional uh, entity that would have means and would propose a number of action that would be backed by the international community through the appropriate way. And we thought, again, that uh, the international community as a whole, plus the G20 as the, having the capacity to give the uh, political might which was necessary at a global level would probably be a good solution. Now, of course, all this has to crystallize in, in decisions, and we discussed that together, by the way, Professor. So uh, I hope very much that uh, we will have the new, I would say, way of uh, coping with the next challenges. And it was said so clearly by all speakers that uh, we have also to prepare for the next pandemic, which will come, uh, unavoidably, probably. And uh, so we will see what happens. It's a question of days, in a way, now, taking into account the meeting of the G1. Thank you very much. With this, uh, I'd like to close the session and really thank uh, all panelists and, and you for the audience, uh, in the audience for being so active. Thank you.